Um, I'm just going to start us off by just quickly walking us through the agenda and why we're here today, and then I'll turn it over to Jed to give us a presentation. So as you know, we're in the plans room. We're going to focus on uh, kind of broadly on the development plans that are being proposed. Um, we're also going to have conversations about economic development, which is the table at the back, and social infrastructure, which is the table uh, to my right at the back as well. Um, and we're really here today to do a bit of a deeper dive into the plans and to provide more information um, in an effort to help you better understand what's in the proposal. We also want to hear from you in terms of uh, questions that can get you that information you need. Uh, also, um, as you're learning more, or if you already know quite a bit about uh, what's in the MIDP and the proposal, um, what you might be comfortable with or like, areas where you're less comfortable or have some concerns, and then any other feedback that you have as well. So in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to Jed. Um, and he's going to take about 10 or 15 minutes to walk us through the plans um, in a bit of a deeper dive. Then we're going to use the majority of the time following that for small table conversations. Um, and we're going to have, there's plenty of resources at your table, which I'll walk you through a little bit more uh, once Jed's finished. And then we'll take about 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes at the end um, to hear a report back from the, the facilitator at each table uh, in terms of some key themes and feedback that they heard uh, from each of those discussions to give everyone in the a room a flavor of what, was, what else was going on. And then if we have a few minutes before we go back to the main room, uh, we can open it up to the, to the rest of the room if there's anything else that you want to add um, at that point. So I'll be back in just a second to walk you through a little bit more about the materials, but I'm going to turn it over to Jed for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Just ask that you hold your questions until we get into the small table discussion so that Jed can get through the presentation and he might answer your questions as he goes through as well. Thanks very much, everyone. Wonderful. I, uh, I might. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Sorry, that's, yes. that's perfect. That reminds me. We're using the mics today uh, because we're um, filming the, the, this part of the presentation will be filmed as well as the report back. So that's why we're using the mic so that they can hear it through the audio recording as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name's Jed. Um, I'm, a, I'm a director of development planning for Waterfront Toronto. Um, and I'm, I'm, part of my job is to, to help, help facilitate development in the, what's called the central waterfront area. Um, and in addition to that, I've been working with the, with the waterfront team on the Keyside project. Um, and I'm just, we had this slide up. I think everyone knows where we are. We're going to be talking about Keyside River and the River District, social infrastructure and uh, economic development today. So I want to orient you to the plan itself. Um, and this is Keyside. And for those of you who don't know where Keyside is, this obviously is Lake Ontario. This is what's called the Parliament Slip. This is showing the, the proposal for the, the Keyside plan. This is Parliament Street and Queen's Key East. Um, the plan itself is broken up into five different, um, five different development blocks. From here, this is Bonnie Castle Street, Parliament Street, and then this is a new street just east of Parliament Street. The proposal sits and the proposed area sits and straddles two what are called precincts. Waterfront Toronto, along with the City of Toronto, as part of development in the waterfront, creates precinct plans that identify uh, the built form and use mix of each neighborhood. So this part here is covered by a precinct called the East Bayfront Precinct. And this part here is covered by a precinct called Keating Channel Precinct. This is Keating Channel here that runs east-west and it connects to the Don River. The precinct plans imagine a mix of residential and commercial or other non-residential uses of about 75% residential use and 25% non-residential. One of the key things about the, the precinct plans and part of Waterfront Toronto's mandate is to connect people better to the lake and create an environment that's more vibrant, more livable, and more kind of exciting and interesting for the rest of Toronto. In order to do that, one of the things that we've, we, we require of part of our precincts is ground level animation. So uses at the base of all of the buildings that uh, stimulate kind of a, a vibrant urban realm. So cafes, stores, stuff like that along Queen's Quay. And in addition to that, we also have designed in all of the precinct, precincts what's called 
uh, water's edge promenades, so a large piece of, of waterfront strip that is good for people to come down and walk along the water. Um, the, key, the, the other thing to note about the precinct plan is both the Keating Channel precinct plan and the East Bayfront precinct plan imagine a school on this site, uh, a primary school on this site. And in fact, the, the, the proposed development does. It, it provi provides a, a, a school on this part of the, part of the precinct. If we then scale out a little bit, um, we get to what's called the River District. And I'm going to walk you through, you've seen this before when Christina was doing the presentation, but I'll walk you through some of the details so that you understand where Keyside is in relationship to what is called the Idea District or the River District. So Keyside is what we just looked at, it's right here. The red line represents the planned light rail, so LRT, that is as yet it's planned, it's not funded yet. The black dot outlines what Sidewalk Labs is calling the Idea District, and it is a larger area where the innovations proposed in Keyside would be scaled up across what is the rest of the Portlands. What's also interesting to note about this is these McCleary, South River, and Polson Key, as well as Villiers, are all subject to future precinct plans. Precinct plans haven't been done yet, but they would be done as part of development in the future. All of this area, including what's called Villiers Island, is covered by the, the Portlands planning framework, which imagines development in the Portlands up to 2050. So it's a very, very long-term plan that looks at creating a mix of uses that, that exist in kind of symbiotic relationship with some of the, the former industrial and industrial uses throughout the rest of the Portlands. Villiers Island also has a precinct plan attached to it, and Sidewalk Labs has proposed a Google headquarters on Villiers West, which is the westernmost edge of the island. In terms of Waterfront Toronto's review, what we're going to be looking at with respect to the Keyside plan is we're going to be looking at the density of the proposal against what the density was proposed in the precinct plan. We're going to be reviewing it against the heights and massing of the buildings, so where the, how tall the buildings are and where they are in relationship to each other. The mix of uses, so making sure that we're achieving at least 75% residential and 25% non-residential looking at the community facilities proposed, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the community facilities, one of which is the, the primary school. We're gonna be looking at Queen's Key and how the plan uh, reflects what, what has already been proposed for Queen's Key as part of the transit extension, but also the Queen's Key environmental assessment. We're gonna be looking at connectivity through the site, how the site provides parking, how the, how the ground floor is animated, so those, those ground floor spaces, as well as the water's, the water's edge, how the water's edge is treated and how the water's edge promenade continues through the site. At a larger level, we're also going to be looking at the river district, but we're going to be re reviewing it against the, pre the Villiers Island precinct plan and the Portlands planning framework, but a much higher level because the proposal for the river district is about kind of scaling up rather than a development proposal. In addition to the physical development as a residential and mix of uses, Sidewalk Labs has proposed a community hub to be built in the base of, of one of the buildings called a Care Collective, and it would act kind of like a community care facility or and offer healthcare services as well as wellness services. They've also proposed a civic assembly that would act kind of like uh, a, a community center, so a place for people in the community, a designated place for people to come together, as well as an elementary school in the same location that was provided for in the precinct plans. In order to support these, Sidewalk Labs has proposed some digital tools. One is called CoLab, which is a way for people to collaborate digitally on proposing different changes, for example, to the public realm, and Seed Space, which is a proposed app that would help with leasing 
in the ground floor animated areas, which Sidewalk Labs is calling a STOA. So the first two levels of, of development in Keyside, the first two floors will be STOA, which is an idea of a flexible, different kinds of uses that would animate the first two floors of, of the development. In terms of our initial review, Sidewalk Labs has proposed more community facility space than, than was called for in the East Bayfront Precinct Plan. So there, there was 60,000 square feet allocated to a school, and the proposal is for an additional 30,000 square feet in the, the, both the Care Collective and the um, Civic Assembly. The space is, is proposed to be funded through city fees and development charges, just like how you would do that throughout the rest of the city. And it should be noted that the proposal doesn't rely on any privatization of any existing public spaces. So those spaces would all operate publicly. And then in terms of economic development, Waterfront Toronto, one of our big pushes is for economic development on the waterfront. And Sidewalk Labs has proposed, as a result of the Idea District, that their proposal could facilitate the acceleration of development in the Portlands by 10 years. So instead of a, a, a plan to 2050, it would be till 2040. It also asserts that, that by locating on Villiers West, that the creation of an urban innovation institute um, and an urban innovation cluster along the waterfront would also help accelerate the development proposal for the rest of the Portlands. Sidewalk Labs has proposed, as I mentioned, the dark blue area, um, a mixed use development on Villiers West, anchored by an Urban Innovation Institute. They've also committed $10 million as funding, initial funding for the Urban Innovation Institute, and another $10 million for, um, in seed funding to allow for venture funds focused on small startups as part of that urban innovation cluster. In addition to which, they're proposing up to 500,000 square, 500, square foot Google Canada headquarters. Sidewalk Labs also has proposed that as part of the economic development, 10% of all the construction labor hours be targeted to historically disadvantaged groups. With respect to our initial review of the economic development, one of the things that we wanted to note is, although the development would be proposed to be 10 years shorter than the proposed, the, the initial Portland's planning framework of 2050, it would come with some upfront commitments um, and investment, necessary public investment for the, uh, the infrastructure to be built to support that accelerated development. Um, and the economic development outcomes in the draft MIDP assumes that accelerated public development. What Sidewalk Labs has also offered is optional financing to help support the creation of that infrastructure that would be paid back through a number of different uh, facilities, so tax increment financing or land value capture in the future. So that gives you kind of an overall sense of what, what has been proposed in both Villiers West Keyside and the Idea District or River District. And now we're going to break into smaller groups and talk about what that actually means. So thank you. So as Jed mentioned, we're going to, uh, in just a minute, we're going to break into our, or we're going to stay in our smaller groups and we're going to have some more detailed uh, conversations. So as you can see, in addition to the Waterfront Toronto staff and the facilitation team, there's a number of resources on your table. One of the key pieces that's been uh, spoken to today already is this note to reader. There should be a few copies, printed copies on each table. And this is really uh, Waterfront Toronto's um, early take or early thinking on how to um, assess and start to work through that much larger uh, document, which is the MIDP and the proposals in it. So um, there's copies here that you can, uh, you can look at and review as you have those discussions as well, and the Waterfront Toronto team can help navigate through. All right, we're going to do a report back now. So if everyone wants to put their attention up here, we're going to go around to each table. Um, I'm going to get each of the facilitators at the table to give us a flavor for the discussions at their table, focusing on uh, the key topics that were discussed, if there is key parts of the proposal that people were either comfortable with or liked, or if there's other areas where there were some more concerns, and any other major topics that were discussed. So I'm going to start uh, with Danielle, and we're talking about the plans at this table. 
Okay, great. And uh, thank you to our table for such a rich discussion. Um, so just to start, there is a lot of appreciation for the credibility and the process that Waterfront Toronto um, has and is undertaking in this consultation process uh, specifically. And although um, folks identify that there are concerns and problems with the existing plan, that those concerns should be addressed um, and that it shouldn't stop the plan from, from moving forward and that there's trust in Waterfront Toronto and an appreciation again for this process. Um, there were identified risks, um, among them that Sidewalk Labs uh, is sort of out in front of this process, um, and including out in front of uh, City Council and Waterfront Toronto, so there's a need and it's important um, to catch everybody up, including the public, to that process, and that this consultation uh, here today is a, is a valuable part of that. Um, some more specific, tangible um, kind of concerns um, uh, include that there isn't a high school planned for the space, so that there's a secondary school and post-secondary, but nothing for, for, for kids as they get older into secondary school. Um, a priority that the planning um, that occurs as part of this development aligns with the city's master plan, and that there's also a priority um, to support the capacity and development of um, transit. So unlike like examples were raised like with Liberty Village, that there is the, the capacity both financially um, and, uh, and otherwise to build the necessary transit and also to the opportunity to look at um, unique um, funding opportunity or like funding levers to support, to support transit and that this project may be an opportunity to test some of those um, funding mechanisms. Um, there is a priority uh, to ensure mixed um, mixed housing, so of, like the integration of affordability housing with market housing. That was a strong priority, um, and examples of where it's been done well. But we don't want we want that to be a key part um, of the plan moving forward. Some concern about. Um, the potential uh, or the risk of speculation, um, particularly if Google's headquarters is gonna be relocated um, and the impact of gentrification. So a real priority to ensure um, inclusive development um, with a focus on, on housing, as well as a priority for inclusive space. Um, so just building on some of the aspects of the plan that there's space for people to interact together, um, including um, dog walking specifically. Um, and that we have adequate uh, infrastructure. Um, so if we are densifying residential housing, we have adequate infrastructure for um, things like sewage and like the residential infrastructure needed. Um, overall, in terms of priorities moving forward, um, there's a, a lot of appreciation for the innovative ideas that are represented in the plan and a desire to move them forward and for Toronto and the waterfront to really show, to be a showcase, like it's a showcasing opportunity, an opportunity for economic opportunity and for tourism. Um, also, there was a, a um, things that were liked in the plan in terms of moving forward. Um, that we want to keep um, is the global scale aspiration that uh, Sidewalk Labs has proposed. Um, okay, yeah. uh, and there's lots of other notes here that our table we, we will capture for you. Yeah, and these reports won't capture absolutely everything that was discussed, it's just to give the rest of the room a flavor. I just had one question for this table, I wanted to make sure I got it right. In terms of uh, the affordable housing and mixed housing, it was about the the idea was to have that, but also have it integrated with uh, with other forms of market housing. Is that is that correct? It wasn't just that there should be affordable housing, but that it should be integrated. Okay, great. I just wanted. Not only negative comments about public housing at all. Great, that's good. To, great, thanks very much. I'm going to come over to Ilda next. Uh, also talking about the plans. <laughs> Hi. Um, we, we had a very interesting and a good discussion on the Keyside plan, and in general, there was a consensus that we should move, or that uh, Waterfront and SWL should move forward with the plan. There's a lot of great innovation ideas. Um, there was also good consensus on affordable housing. People were very agreeable and wanted to see that move forward, and some discussion ensued based on how many units for rental and affordable housing and just uh, in general. Um, there was um, fear of 
corporate bullying, and that went into the relationship between uh, Waterford Toronto and SWL, and what was that collaboration going to be, and what would be put in as a plan to ensure that the uh, partnership was equitable and fair and transparent, and that it would not be taken over by the private sector, and that it's just based on monetization and profits. Um, there was also concern on how the city will put in the infrastructure um, for specifically the technology piece, and um, that was required to make it economically viable, and it was raised that that onus would be placed on the partner and not on the city. The city would sort of be put in um, the traditional uh, infrastructure, but anything with Google and the IT and sectors, that would something that would be proposed or looked into from the partners, and they would be their responsibility for the funding. That sort of idea came through. And then there was this piece on governance, and based on that it's such a small 12 acres land or key site, um, what would be the governance level? Like, is it, you know, is it, because it's such a small piece, how are they all going to come together, and what will be the process in, in developing this, this piece of land through the MIDP? And um, is it worth it? Sort of the question was raised, uh, and what will be the complexities of that? Okay. That's great. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to come to Meg next uh, for the social infrastructure table, if I can fit through. Thank you. Uh, so we talked about social infrastructure. Um, we initially started by talking about some of the concerns around financing uh, the operational costs and would that be a, a big chunk of public capital who would maintain uh, the ongoing financing of any social infrastructure proposed. Uh, we talked about how it's very important for whatever is built to be integrated into in existing infrastructure, both transit infrastructure, other social infrastructure, governance infrastructure. Um, there was some uh, questions about how exactly the needs assessment would be done of what services would be provided in the area, how to ensure that they're not replicating existing services elsewhere. Um, and a question about is Sidewalk Labs uh, proposing services um, that they actually can't deliver because they don't have the, uh, the mechanisms to do so. Um, and uh, another question of exactly what modification to regulation uh, is being proposed. And generally speaking, a desire for more clarity about exactly how this would be implemented. Thanks, Mike. And last but not least, I'll come over to Andre and the economic development table. Thank you very much. Um, well, so I also would like to thank the group. We had we had a great discussion, and hopefully, I can uh, do it do it some justice here. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a couple of more, um, I guess, sort of technical sort of questions or, or areas. One was, was just around how, how to ensure accountability for the outcomes as, as this comes together, both, both in working with Sidewalk or with, with Google, but also with other third parties that, that would be engaged. We talked a little bit about the contracting mechanisms and areas where Waterfront has some experience on that. A second was around uh, mobility capacity and how we can, we can be sure that that would enable the, the sort of economic development objectives that we're looking at, and you know, wh whether in fact we're sure that an LRT would, would serve the site, and, and those, those types of questions. Um, and then the, the latter areas sort of um, are, are sort of broader questions, I think, around, around the economic development piece. Um, so one of them was really the question of um, what does success actually look like with economic development and, and who's, who's sort of setting the objectives? Um, and, and I think to some extent that there's maybe some confusion around the motivation for it. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think si if Sidewalk's objectives are, are around creating a replicable economic model that they could take elsewhere in the world, but waterfronts, um, you know, are more so around... Uh, job creation, local economic activity, uh, affordability, waterfront development. How do we make sure those are squared, or is there, is there kind of a conflict there? Um, there was another, another big and, I think, important one around the question of what does economic, what would we actually mean by economic development um, in, in, you know, in a different way? Are, are we talking about local economic activity in, in this area? Or are we talking more broadly about um, uh, broader um, economic implications for the city of Toronto and, and for the country? And you know, one observation was it's tough to disentangle this conversation from the IP data governance and privacy stuff, uh, which is, I know, something we've heard in, in some of the other um, consultations as well. 
uh, and also that it wasn't immediately clear what the benefits would be to the Canadian tech sector and to, um, uh, to local startups. Uh, and then the final one sort of flows out of that is, is there a risk that there's a bit of a power asymmetry with, uh, with Google Sidewalk as all this comes together? The way the tech economy has evolved, that you, you know, there's a risk that there could be um, like a closed ecosystem of, of sort of Google-related products that could block others, or, or is that a risk? Um, could that limit opportunity for, for local startups? Um, and, and the importance of trust, I think, was how do, how do we trust that, that those types of outcomes won't, won't happen? I hope I, I hope I got it. Thanks, Andre. That's great. So we've got about 10 minutes or so before we start to make a move back to the, the main room. I'm going to stay in the center so I can move around a bit easier. Um, I just want to open it up now to the room. If there's anything else that you wanted to build on from what you heard or what you were saying at your tables, um, or if you have any kind of last-minute questions or any new ideas that have, have been sparked from what you heard from the other tables as well. So if you would like to share something with the rest of the room or have a question, just throw your hand up, and I'll come around um, to you. Oh, there we go. Perfect. I have a question regarding the, uh, the school so capacity. Use, use the mic so they can hear it. Yeah. Uh, the question's about the s public school. What the, do you know what the school capacity is? Like, what, uh, what's the expectation sorry, of kids the, there? The number of kids I don't actually know. Is it 600? That's what I thought. Okay. Okay. But I wasn't sure. I thought it was 600. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'll come around here. Sorry, Ilda, can you just move in? Oh, there you go. Thanks. We're talking about futures, and I don't think we are putting enough concentration on families and children and coming into this area. Um, the two and three bedrooms that we are going to need minimally and the school and the continuous learning, this is a golden opportunity to raise children in um, a very open environment with so much potential. And it's not mentioned much in anything. Great, thanks. Yep, Julie. Hi. I, I'd like to emphasize um, in the social infrastructure how, m how much is implied can be done um, that isn't in sidewalks uh, power to deliver. For instance, I live next door to a glorious community that Waterfront Toronto has made happen, the West Donlands. And we have a school site there. And people whose front doors face an empty school site are putting their kids on school buses. Can sidewalk guarantee that there'll be a school on the site they propose before West Donlands gets a school? I think that would cause problems. And there are places all over the city that are waiting for schools, family practice clinics, all of those things. And we get all kinds of waffle about a care collective. What the heck that means, I don't know. Um, and it's, you know, we have a, a public health system. It's not up to sidewalk to decide what health services we get. And they certainly can't make promises. I mean, it, uh, maybe all of these questions are answered somewhere else, but I've read about 800 pages of this. And all I get is referrals to other pages, many hundreds of pages later, which I haven't had time to get to yet. So it would be really good if they could rewrite this damn thing into about 400 words of what actually is meant and cut out all of the waffle and the repetition and the pie in the sky stuff that they have no ability to deliver. Thanks, Julie. Anybody else? Okay, well, um, since there isn't anyone else, I'll just kind of explain what's going to happen next. We're going to um, make our way back to the, the main room. I think the other rooms will be filtering in um, at about 11 o'clock or just afterwards. So you can head back upstairs as the elevator is just to your right where you came down, or you can take the stairs that are immediately out ahead. And uh, we can also, if you want to stop for a minute and take a look at the boards, we'll also start to convene people once everyone's back upstairs. We're going to take the next um, hour to hear back from the rooms in the same way that we did a, um, a bit of a mini report back from each table here. Um, I'll report back on kind of key themes that we heard across 
across the tables in this room, and so will all the other tables. So you'll get a chance to hear from the other rooms as well. And then we'll open it up again to the rest of the room if there's anyone else that wants to add anything. So we'll be, if you just want to kind of gradually make your way back up um, to the main room, the auditorium where we started, um, we'll, get, we'll continue there. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate you coming out and sharing your feedback. Thank you.